Good morning, everybody. It's Tuesday, February 20th, 528 a.m. Central Time. Grain markets are mixed to higher this morning. March corn futures up three and a quarter at 419 and three quarters. March soybeans up 10 and a half at 1182 and three quarters. March Chicago wheat up a quarter cent at 560 and three quarters. March Kansas City wheat up two and a quarter at 569 and a half. March spring wheat down two and a quarter at 652 and a half. Uh, Mackenzie, we hit 13,000 subscribers on YouTube um, over the weekend. Yes, that's pretty darned exciting. And YouTube tells me that um, about half the people, it's actually slightly more than half, about 52% of the people who watch are not subscribed. So if you guys watch these videos and you are not subscribed on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave us a comment. Um, also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, make sure to leave us a review. I haven't asked you guys to do this stuff for months, but um, go ahead and do it if you have not. All right, let's get into the news here. The White House may soon make it tougher, tougher for ethanol producers to qualify for sustainable aviation fuel tax credits. The Biden administration is anticipated to announce a modification to its scientific modeling for ethanol. The change will show that ethanol is less effective at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Reuters reporting indicates that the adjustment will penalize those who convert land into corn production, but will reward climate smart farming practices such as no-till and cover crops. According to a White House spokesman, no final decision has been made on the climate model. So this is all like rumor mill type stuff. But in my experience, Reuters reporting, and that's what this is, they're very good. Uh, they're usually fairly accurate. This is a situation where the headline is much scarier than the actual news. So the, the penalty here, the way that it sounds, is when land is converted to grow corn. So I'm assuming that would be like idled land. And that's not the direction we're going in the United States. We're not turning any more uh, acreage into cornfields. We're, we're going in the opposite direction. If anything, we're turning corn acreage into dollar generals and subdivisions. So I, I don't really think that's the issue. If that's, if that's what it takes in this deal to satisfy the environmentalists, then great. Uh, the more important part is that they're going to reward climate smart farming techniques like no-till cover crops. The deal here is this, and Paul Neifer did a great video uh, for our premium subs uh, several weeks ago. Act now to benefit from sustainable aviation fuel. You, There are steps that you as a farmer or corn grower are going to need to take to uh, first off, measure your carbon intensity score. And then secondly, work with your grain buyer or ethanol plant in, in particular to uh, help the ethanol plant to reach these carbon goals. Because part of the score is the corn score, which comes from your farm. And if you guys are not already doing this, you need to watch this video with Paul. Um, he lays out exactly what you need to be doing and how to do it. And if you guys aren't doing this stuff, if you're not tracking your carbon scores, if you're not getting lined up for this, this is the future. This is going to be the future of corn demand. And if you're not on top of it, you're going to be left behind. Uh, there was a link to that vi older video in this morning's email. So premium subs, it's in there. It's in the first paragraph. Um, if you guys sign up for the premium deal this morning, I will forward you a copy of the email, which again includes that video. Fund traders continue to hold a historically large net short position across the corn and soybean complex. CFTC released weekly commitment of traders data on Friday. During the week ending February 13th, the funds were net sellers of 11,000 contracts of corn. The net short of 305,000 contracts is the largest since early 2019. Funds were net sellers of 3,000 contracts of soybeans. The net short of 124,000 contracts is the largest since mid-2019. And the funds were net buyers of 11,000 contracts of SRW wheat on the week. The last time the funds were this heavily short the corn market and also the soybean market was during the U.S.-China trade war. The uh, phase one trade deal was signed in January of 2020. So you're talking the uh, most heavy net short position for the funds in row crops since your uh, pre-trade deal and also pre-COVID. Like, you know, um, they weren't even this heavily short during the COVID period, which is pretty crazy. When you look at the chart of corn soybeans, we combined, we combined, uh, we uh, updated this again this week, 487,000 contracts. So on the whole, um, yeah, you got to go back to 2019. And this is very extreme. It just speaks to the negative sentiment surrounding grain and oil seed prices. It's uh, not a good look. So if you guys have not checked out our premium content, you need to do so. Joe, can you tell me about the video you put together last week? 
Pete Meyer is our newest premium contributor, and uh, we are thrilled to have him aboard. He's one of the smartest market people I know. Uh, Pete was on last week, and we did a rundown of the Ag Outlook Forum, uh, We the numbers. We ran the balance sheets. We ran some different possibilities, some different acreage scenarios. Pete's going to be doing a ton with us on the uh, biofuel and renewable front. That's his bread and butter. He knows everything about it more than anybody. So uh, you guys want to sign up for the premium deal just just to see Pete's stuff alone is, is worth the 50 bucks a month, I promise. Uh, go to standardgrain.com. You can sign up this morning. I'll forward you again a copy of this morning's email. This is a $50 per month subscription. You can cancel at any time. No other fee, no other obligation. Nobody will try to sell you anything else. That email, which goes out every morning at 5 a.m. Central, includes our six most recent premium videos, along with a whole bunch of other stuff. Check that deal out this morning, guys. Large Brazilian grain inventories could further pressure grain prices. Como, Brazil's largest farm co-op, began this year with 50% more grain stocks than the year before. Carryover stocks for the co-op accounted for 36% of the total volume that the co-op received in 2023. The large carryover of corn, soybeans, and wheat is due to Brazil's bumper crops last season and reduced farmer sales. The situation for Brazilian farmers when it comes to soybeans is expected to worsen before it gets better. Argentina, which suffered a historical drought last season, is anticipated to harvest twice as many beans this season compared to last year. Looking at the weather to start off the week, I would again call it fairly benign looking. We've got enough rain in the forecast in both Brazil and also in Argentina. Argentina is going to be dry through um, like Thursday and then Friday, you're going to see some uh, cooler temperatures and some rains return. So I don't really see a weather issue. There has been some chatter regarding soybean premiums in Brazil, which have actually rallied uh, the last three weeks. I don't know if that's because of slow farmer sales. Um, there's There are some statistics out there indicating that farmer selling in Brazil is, is slower than it would normally be, probably because they're you know below production costs, just like we are here in the United States, uh, to my knowledge. Could be because the crop just uh, isn't as good as what people had thought. I don't know. A lot of the estimates are coming down. Most of the private groups for the Brazilian soybean crop, which is the one that matters the most. They're down into the mid to upper 140s, so they do uh, continue to decline. In a re-election effort, President Biden plans to delay the administration's requirement for automakers to rapidly increase electric vehicle sales by 2030. A quick transition to EVs would result in lost jobs since their assemb assembly requires fewer workers. Because of this, Biden is concerned that he could lose union support ahead of the election. Additionally, consumer demand for EVs has been poor due to their high price tag and a lack of charging stations. With this modification, a sharp increase in sales would not be required until after 2030. The administration will publish the final rule early this spring. Yeah, they may need to back off a little bit. We've talked at length in recent uh, weeks about how the enthusiasm for EVs has kind of died down a little bit. Biden does officially have the support of the United Auto Workers, which is a big one. He he can't afford to lose that union support. And, and I don't think that he will. But the unions uh, do still have some power in this country when it relates to things um, along those lines. Um, I don't know. I guess this is more rumor mill type stuff and not official yet. They're going to see a final rule early this spring. So we'll see. January wholesale prices rose 0.3% last month, the largest increase since August of last year and higher than the anticipated rise of 0.1%. On an annual basis, wholesale prices increased by 0.9% down from a 1% gain in December. A key factor in the rise in prices was the cost of services increasing by 0.6% last month. Earlier last week, the January CPI report showed inflation rose 3.1% from a year earlier. That was higher than expected and well above the Fed's 2% target. The markets are anticipating that the Fed won't make its first rate cut until late spring or summer. Yeah, the rate cut um, odds keep getting kicked down the road here. So in March, you've now got a 92% chance that rates stay unchanged, 63% chance that they stay unchanged in May. And then June is now when the rate cut is expected, 78% chance that you will see a quarter point cut in June. Looking at the CPI, uh, the charts, I mean, still continue to indicate that the trajectory of inflation is lower, uh, where we're increasing uh, producer prices in this instance at a slower rate. Now, that being said, when you look at the actual index, 
I mean, it's almost as high as it's ever been. It's up uh, almost 20% or 19.4 since January of 2020. And CPI is up almost 20% during that same period. So no, I mean, things aren't getting cheaper. It's just that the uh, rate of increase is getting slower. And that's really what the Fed cares about. You almost never see this version of the chart, the second one. You always see like this version where it's the percent annualized change, which can be can be confusing and kind of misleading. Make no mistake, things are not getting cheaper. It's just they're they're getting expensive less faster. Does that make sense? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What did cattle do on Friday? Um, so they ended the week on a positive note. Feeders were up an average of a buck sixty-seven. Live cattle closed an average of a buck eleven higher. Um, cash cattle trade last week in the north. Cattle traded at one seventy-nine to one eighty, which was one to two dollars lower. In the south, cattle were two dollars lower at one eighty. Box beef was mixed last week. Choice ended the day on, ended the day on Friday at two ninety six twenty. That was up two dollars and twelve cents on the week. Select ended the day on Friday at two eighty six sixty six. That was down thirty six cents on the week. Outside markets fairly quiet to start off the week. U.S. dollars just a little bit lower. Stocks are off a little bit. Bonds are about flat. Crude oil is down. 76 cents in the April WTI at 77.70. Have a great week, guys. We'll talk to you on Wednesday.